Hello and welcome to Railroad Journeys Around the World. Portugal is certainly one of the most inexpensive countries in the EC to travel around in. Yet it boasts a railway network of considerable diversity and appeal, featuring both broad and narrow gauge systems, much of it single tracked. And as we shall see, Portuguese railways, the CP stands for Caminos de Ferro Portugueses, operate an extremely varied and interesting fleet. With a total population of only 10 million people, this lightly inhabited country with its extensive railway network has benefited from a considerable rise in rail investment, particularly since joining the EC. Although today there's no longer any steam to be found, this is more than compensated by some of the unique diesel types, including the Class 1800, the English Electric 50s. There's also the equally interesting USA Build 1500 class Alco Locos and some colourful electric classes working the Lisbon to Oporto services. During the course of this programme, we'll also be examining some of the principal freight flows, including spectacular triple heading on Sinesh coal trains. Finally, there's a look at the extensive and highly scenic Douro Valley network. The location of the capital city of Lisbon on the northern shore of the huge estuary of the River Tagus and the lack of any rail crossing has always had an enormous effect on all potential journeys south and for the time being at least, all services to the Algarve must start or end at Barreiro. Main intercity services between Barreiro and Faro, the capital of the Algarve, are in the hands of these very obviously French-styled 1931-class diesel-electric locomotives. All told, there are a total of 17 locos in this distinctive class, which were built under licence from Alstom in 1981, basically as a follow-on order to the first 13 examples of the original 1900 class. The line immediately south from Barrero to Setubal serves a number of dormitory towns and is used mainly by commuters who work in Lisbon. This local stopping service also employs some distinctive motive power, like these old 1500 class USA Alco diesels, originally introduced in 1948. A few local services are also booked to run further south to Funchera, which involves crossing the River Shado at the old port of Alcasa do Sal. These characteristic sounding locos were given a new lease of life during the 1970s, when their original engines were replaced with more powerful Alco diesel engines. Away from the urban areas, the intermediate stations on the line from Barreiro to Faro are connected by what Portuguese railways term regional trains. One typical regional service is this all-station stopping train from Barreiro to Tunesh, which is routed via Beja. The level of service provided for this extremely rural area with its sparse population is very poor with only a few stopping trains a day. Most services are in the hands of these French built 1200 class diesels which are these days confined solely to working passenger services on the southern region and to shunting duties around Barrero. Elderly Swedish built Nohab rail cars are also used on some local services from Tunesh to Funchera. First commissioned in 1948, they still perform excellently, offering rapid acceleration and a surprising turn of speed. After pausing at the isolated junction station at Funchera to pick up passengers from the first northbound semi-fast to Barrero, this unit is setting off on the lengthy journey northeast to Beja and Evora. One of the main freight traffic flows on the southern region centres on a mineral branch to the Pyrites mine at Neves Corvo, which is situated off the secondary line from Funchera to Beja. 
Recently, a new station avoiding curve has been completed, which will allow trains to bypass Funchera. But for the time being at least, after running into Funchera from Arero, just north of Grandola, with its load of sand and one wagon of cement, the loco will have to run round to gain access to the secondary main line to Beja. The sand is bound for Piotas, a short distance from the mine disposal point on the Nevesh Corvo branch, where it's used to infill at the Pyrites mine. Five kilometers from Funchera, the train gets to grips with this stiff climb past Panoish, towards the junction for the freight-only branch at Urik. Motive power for both the incoming sand trains and the outgoing Pyrites train are generally drawn from the 1900 class, which were built for dedicated freight use. Members of this class are fitted with dynamic braking and have a lower top speed of 100 km per hour compared to the later batch of 1931s which we saw earlier at work on the Algarve passenger services. French parentage, with the styling by Paul Arzen, typical of so many locomotives in France, is clearly evident. Problems with the French diesels fitted to these locomotives has resulted in them being derated from their original 3,000 horsepower to 2,700 horsepower. Imported coal through the port of Sinesh on the Atlantic coast is another important traffic flow on the southern region. The branch itself lost its passenger service in 1990, but sees a very heavy daily usage by freight. This pair of 1321 class locomotives are leaving the junction with the main line at Emadash Sado at the start of the 48 km run to Sinesh. The 18 locos in this class were bought second hand from Spanish railways in 1989. Pago Power Station is the main destination for imported coal, but there's also a book daily working for a pair of 1321s to take a consignment as far as Setil, where electric motive power will take over for the journey to Susalas or Masera. The control center for operations on this picturesque line is in the old station building at Santiago de Casan, which is situated about halfway along the branch. The first train of the day is hauled by a 1500 class Alco, heading towards Sinesh. One of the regular daily coal trains is this short consist bound for the depot at Loulay on the Algarve. As well as coal, Lule Depot also handles a considerable amount of general freight traffic. Here, another 1500 class shunts the daily pickup service from Faro, which will eventually continue as far as Barrero. Okay. Amongst the regular traffic flows handled here is mineral water, <laughs> no doubt destined to be consumed mainly by squeamish tourists, afraid to drink the local water supply. Introduced as long ago as 1948, the Alco 1500s are the oldest mainline diesels still in use. During 1996, the first examples of the class were withdrawn. When new, they were powerful enough to be used on services north from Lisbon to Oporto, but gravitated south when that line was electrified in 1957. typical American road switcher parentage is clearly apparent. After nearly 50 years of service, this class has certainly proved to be both reliable and extremely good value for money.
This is very much a local pickup service, usually stopping at Faro, Bolikem and Tunesh. As the train progresses northward, the consist gets ever more impressive, with extra wagons being added at some of the smaller stations. Pinal Novo, just 16 kilometers out from Barrero, is definitely the hotspot on the southern system. Not only is it well served by passenger trains, but also sees a wide variety of freight. This 1500 class has just come off the branch which leads to the new Ford factory and is heading for Setubal docks with a rake of cars and vans for export. The new branch serving the Ford factory opened in July 1995 and will eventually form part of the link to the new rail bridge over the River Tagus and to Lisbon. Another freight from Entroncamento to Barrero sees a 1500 Alco piloting a 1400 class English electric diesel. The 1400s are allocated to Entroncamento but are now also the mainstay of the Barrero to Setubal local services. This freight serves as a means for transferring the 1400 after maintenance at Entroncamento, ready for its next tour of duty. Timber traffic is fairly substantial, amounting to some 10% of freight traffic. Approaching Pinal Nova from the west is a 1500 class Alco from Barrero with a local service for Setubal. The branch to the new Ford factory can be seen diverging to the left, while in the background is the abandoned Montijo branch. Pinal Novo, like many of the stations in Portugal, features specially commissioned tiled murals depicting local scenes. These often highlight some local noteworthy aspects of daily life and have usually been produced to a very high standard indeed. Despite their age and partly because of the favourable climate, most survive in first class condition. Pinal Novo is one of the few places left on Portuguese railways with operational semaphore signals and about the only place with a signal gantry worthy of the name. Here another Alco brings in a local from Setubal. All signals are worked from this rather grand box. It was built in the early 1960s and controls only the immediate area around the station. This is in contrast to much of Portugal, where either new remotely controlled colour light signalling has been installed, or at the other extreme, movements within station confines are controlled by a linesman with a flag. All the Faro to Barreiro intercity trains run straight through Pinal Novo without stopping, as the station is well served by local services. Due to the habit of passengers walking over the running tracks, the train slows to a crawl and the driver will need to be particularly vigilant. The best known class of locomotive to work the service between Vila Real on the Algarve coast and Barrero are the 1800 class, the English Electrics. 
The original class of only 10 locos were a development of the British Rail Class 50s and were built in 1969 by English Electric at Vulcan Foundry near Manchester. In a scene that's rather reminiscent of Dawlish Seawall in the UK, an 1800 works along the coast near Farrow at the eastern end of the Algarve. mornings at Farrow provide the opportunity of seeing an additional 1800 hauled working, the once weekly blue train from Oporto in the north. This special overnight return working is provided mainly for the benefit of workers who live in the north but have found employment on the Algarve, although the car transporter tends to be used by a few tourists in the know to avoid a very lengthy drive. Many rail fans who are trying to combine a holiday on the Algarve with rail interests make their first contact with Portuguese railways at Faro Station. This first morning northbound into regional leaves Faro, we catch another glimpse of the blue train stabled at the south platform. The blue train runs northbound on Friday, returning overnight on Sunday from Oporto, with the 1800 only coming on at Entroncamento. This loco will then join the regular pool to work trains to Barrero. The 1800s provide traction for all the daily inter-regional services between Barrero and the Algarve. This amounts to two trains which run during the day and one overnight service. They're basically semi-fast stopping trains which are pathed in between the intercity and local services that we've already examined. All told, the regional and inter-regional trains account for around 13% of all passenger volumes. The cab layout differs somewhat from the BR Class 50 in having an instrument desk more in keeping with the Class 37 or Class 40 in style. Another major change is the continental style of driver's power controller which is in the form of a steering wheel. Dead man's control is a foot-operated pedal, which consistently has to be depressed. A different turbocharger arrangement on the engine means that the 1800s sound very similar to, but not quite identical to, a Class 50. A further cause for the difference in sound is the direct drive arrangement for the radiator fan rather than the electric motor drive used in class 50s. The 1800s have undoubtedly been one of the best diesels that the CP have bought, although time could well be running out for them on these passenger turns. Current plans are to replace them with 1960s, cascaded from the Vila Formoso line in June 1997. The 1800s will then be relegated to freight duties. Allowing for the numerous curves and the extra width of the super-elevated broad gauge track, overall line speed is impressive. The track is maintained to a very high standard and the ride is particularly smooth even at speed. Despite the very hilly nature of the terrain, there are only two tunnels on the line, including this short section near Santa Clara. This is very poor agricultural land, although even close to the line there's plenty of evidence of the only major agricultural industry in this area, the production of cork. 
About every 10 years or so, large sections of bark are removed from evergreen oak trees and collected locally for eventual sale as cork. This has always provided a significant source of local income and its importance has often been recorded in the tiles that adorn many stations. The isolated junction station of Funchera is situated over two kilometres away from the small town from which it takes its name and is where the line to Beja diverges east. Our northbound morning into regional service has a booked connection here with the Nohab unit which is waiting on the right with the all stations regional service to Evora. Today's secondary mainline service to Beja follows what was originally the old mainline route to Barrero. The impressive station here at Funchera was only built in 1919 and is a direct result of the present mainline from Barrero to Alcasa and Ermidash being opened to connect here in 1920. Standard driving practice tends to mean that acceleration from rest to line speed is fairly slow and gradual. Nostalgic yearnings for the old UK class 50s makes it easy to see why these powerful and good looking machines are so popular with English rail fans. Perhaps what is strange is that this distinctive class, in its final sunset, has so far attracted comparatively little interest on the international rail tour front. Barrero Station is the present terminus for all northbound services and also the connection for ferry services to Lisbon. Released from its stock, this 1800 makes its way past CP's main diesel workshops to the nearby depot and fueling point. The stabling point is located around the old steam half roundhouse. One of the principal freight flows on the CP takes imported coal on a lengthy journey from Sinesh on the Atlantic coast to a power station in the eastern Alentejo at Pago, not far from Abrantes. For the present, the heavy power station coal trains require triple heading on the steeply graded Sinesh branch itself, although double heading over the rest of the route suffices. The motive power for the triple-headed trains is always provided from a special pool of 1900s which have had their buffers removed and a central Buckeye coupling fitted to allow them to work in multiple. All told, there are three daily diagrams for coal between the port at Sinesh and the power station at Pago. These fully loaded 2,500 tonne trains are the heaviest to be found on Portuguese railways. 
Shortly after leaving the reception sidings, the driver is able to accelerate away from the port at Chinesh and take a glimpse of the Atlantic Ocean before heading inland. After skirting the Atlantic, the line eventually gains height by crossing the main Sinesh to Odomira Road over this impressive new viaduct, which is situated close to a local car station. This also consumes imported coal, but because of the short distance from the port, its speed is by a series of lengthy conveyor belts in tunnels. Although closed to passenger traffic for seven years, the station at Santiago de Casem remains in extremely good condition, with no damage to any of its superb decorative tiles. Today this is the only manned station on the branch, and the staff are friendly and informative about movements, provided they are approached politely. Most of the triple-headed trains work straight through to Ermidash, but often pass at least one other train, usually here at Santiago, on this busy single-track line. Train services, although reliable, are often infrequent particularly in the more sparsely populated areas, and great care will be needed in journey planning. Fares are reasonable, but the national timetable is hard to come by, except in Lisbon, and is confusing to use, with some services on the same line being split across different timetables. Car hire also is very good value, but Portuguese roadmaps, which are frequently out of date, leave a lot to be desired, and even the otherwise excellent Quail railway map has some mistakes. Some of Portugal's most appealing narrow-gauge operations can be found in the remaining portion of the Val de Voga network. This runs from the Lisbon to Oporto main line at Aveiro, via loop through Senada de Vuga and back to the same main line at the seaside town of Esfino. The southern end of the narrow gauge line meets up with the broad gauge main line here at the busy coastal town of Aveiro. The line was originally built to serve a large sparsely populated area that couldn't possibly justify the cost of a standard broad gauge service. The Aveiro to Senada section passes through a very rural landscape and the service frequency is not as great as on the northern section from Senada to Esfino. The traditional diesel power on this system is still provided by meter gauge versions of the standard gauge Allen rail cars which on some services tow a single trailer car. The line has always attracted considerable interest from rail fans, particularly during the later steam days. Today there's a small museum at Machinata de Voga, which features both steam and diesel motive power that was formerly used on this system. As the driver approaches Sonada de Voga from the south, the linesman's flag tells him that he's cleared for the final approach to the station over a very unusual bridge. This combined road-rail bridge is not totally unique. There was another similar one at Pocino on the now-closed Sabor line. Even in Portugal, traffic isn't allowed to use the bridge at the same time as the train. The network used to branch off east here at Senada de Voga for the important inland spa town of Vizu. It then ran on to eventually connect at Santa Combo Dao with the main Pampilosa to Guada main line, but sadly this section was closed in 1989. 
The Sonata de Voga network was first opened in two stages, with the final sections being completed in 1914, by which time it boasted no less than 74 stations. Despite the closure of the Visu section, to some extent it has led a charmed life. At the end of steam in 1972, the whole system was temporarily closed as a short-term economy measure, but fortunately the remaining sections resumed service in 1975. However, narrow-gauge operations like this are constantly under review, and the CP are currently seeking a private operator to take over this network, so it would be wise to sample its undoubted charms without delay. North of Senado, the line climbs steeply out of the river valley to the major town of Oliveira de Azimes. <laughs> Despite this sign, the line hasn't seen steam for over 20 years. The state of the track on this little system leaves something to be desired in places. Nevertheless, its quaint character is very appealing. This section from Oliveira to Esfino does carry a relatively heavy weekday commuter traffic, which then feeds into the mainline services to a porto. So the long-term future of at least this portion of the original network does look fairly secure. The capital city of Lisbon, with its amazing network of cobbled streets and steep hills, is well worth visiting, both from a general interest and a railway point of view. Although 86% of CP's passenger volume comes in the form of suburban passenger receipts, and despite being a city that's extremely well served by a vast array of different public transport methods, Lisbon city centre is totally choked by private motor cars. The Estoril line, which runs from Lisbon's Caesh de Sodra station to Cascais and the seaside resort of Estoril, was the first section of the CP to be electrified during the 1920s, and it still employs 1500 volts DC overhead supply. This route was only nationalised in 1976, and many of the bud designed units date back to the early 1960s. Today, up to seven car formations are used to operate this intensive service. The route from Lisbon's Rosio station to Sintra was the subject of a full revamp during the early 1990s. New rolling stock was provided, built at the Sawfame Works just outside Lisbon using ABB equipment. The line runs for 27 kilometres to the resort town of Sintra and was electrified as long ago as 1957. The impressive Rosio station is a mock manual line building, with the actual train shed and platforms being gained by some rather improbable escalators through a shopping mall. The station was built in 1910 and extensively refurbished in the early 90s. Lisbon also has the benefit of a metro system, the basic configuration of which is currently U-shaped, but is undergoing considerable extension. Rather strangely, it's built to the standard 4 foot 8.5 inch gauge, completely out of character with the rest of the country's broad and narrow gauges. Work began as long ago as 1955, and the line was built using the cut and fill method. Currently, Rosio is the only CP station which is linked to the tube network. No visit to Lisbon would be complete without a ride on one of its famous trams, some of which have electrical equipment built by Dick Kerr of Preston, dating back before the First World War. Sadly, many of the tram routes have now been abandoned, although the principal services along the coast towards Estoril survive. Many trams have been modernised and they're extremely popular with both visitors and locals. Investment is continuing. These new units were commissioned in 1995. Lisbon is built on a switchback of hills and several funicular railways like this one near Rosio station help ease the strain for pedestrians.
Santa Apollonia is Lisbon's principal station and the terminus for intercity services to Oporto and other parts of eastern and northern Portugal, as well as the international services from Madrid and Paris. Only 11 years separate the different design philosophies of these two equally distinctive generations of electric locomotives. The clear French influence of the 2600 class and the later build of nine locomotives numbered from 2621 upwards is once again evident. The first batch of 12 were built in 1974. The 2551s, which were state-of-the-art in 1963, have the same stainless steel fluted body side as the bud pattern coaches, giving a totally integrated and almost American streamlined look, albeit perhaps a bit dated these days. The services between Lisbon and Oporto comprise a mixture of both air-conditioned and non-air-conditioned stock, depending on the type of service. All the recently produced stainless steel coaches were made by Sawfarm and are basically French Conrail coaches that are air-conditioned. Sawfarm are now the only manufacturers of stainless steel rolling stock in the world and have recently even made some body shells for export to California. At present, this is Portugal's only principal main line, and it was electrified in 1957 to 25,000 kilovolts AC. Through services from Madrid, Marval, means that some Spanish coaching stock works through to Lisbon on the Sud Express, while other Spanish coaches are merely hired in to help with a temporary shortage of rolling stock. Railways were late arriving and generally slow to develop in Portugal, although the potential of this route north to the second city of Oporto was quickly realised. The first part opened in 1856 and continued in stages until Oporto was reached in 1865. The broad gauge of 5 foot 6 inches was chosen as a result of wanting to integrate with the neighbouring Spanish network. Ironically, consideration is currently being given to converting at least the main international routes to the standard European gauge. At present, intercity services like these only account for 1% of total passenger volumes. Portuguese railways appear to be running counter to the trend in the rest of Europe and have actually seen a steady growth in freight tonnages since 1990 when local goods facilities were generally withdrawn. This pair of English Electric 1400s are approaching a Porto's Campana station, having just crossed over the river Douro. Only the first 10 of this class were built at Vulcan Foundry, the remaining 57 being assembled at Saw Farm using components supplied from Britain. They are the most numerous locomotive class found on the CP and have been very successful. Campana is the main station in Oporto, where the intercity services from Lisbon terminate. For such an important town, the station, which was rebuilt in the 1960s, is rather plain. No need for footbridges or subways here. Campana is a through station, but only trains from the north are able to continue into the city centre to use the terminal at São Bento station. 
Local services for commuters are mainly in the hands of these 2151 class EMUs. This is a typical all stations outer suburban from Aveiro. to upgrade Campana station include adding a further six tracks to the existing ten and incorporating a new integrated bus terminal. 1400s working services through from the Douro Valley with their red and white Swiss-built coaches all call at Campana. Plans are currently underway to electrify the first part of the line to the Douro Valley, which carries the largest number of commuters, and this will mean that all services from Marco will soon be operated by EMUs. This corridor, linking the western end of the Douro to Oporto, generates enough traffic to warrant 1400s working in pairs on many of the morning and evening peak trains. Sao Bento station is more central than Campana, which is out at the eastern edge of the city, and is also the terminus for services from the Douro and other points northward. In a city that's famed for its beautiful mural tiles, the thousands of commuters that pass through here each day appear to be largely oblivious to this magnificently ornate booking hall. The mainly blue and white tiles depict historic and rural scenes, below a coloured frieze portraying the development of transport in Portugal. The tiles were painted in 1930 by Georges Colico and today are something of a tourist attraction. Only a few of the murals depict anything of railway interest, but it's noticeable that the locos featured don't show the same detail and accuracy as the other scenes. As well as services to the Douro Valley commencing here, trains which are generally DMU worked also depart for the north to Viana do Castillo and Valencia and then on over the border into Spain. The station also handles a heavy suburban traffic from the Oporto hinterland. The Douro Valley line, which runs from Ermazind at the junction of the Oporto to Valencia main line, closely follows the Douro River towards the Spanish border and unquestionably offers the most scenic railway journey in the whole of Portugal. Regua is an important staging point about halfway along the route. It's the end of the Oporto outer suburban network traffic and is also the terminus of the meter gauge branch from Vila Real. The line was built in stages between 1875 and 1887 and used to provide a through route to Spain via Barca de Alva at the frontier. But cross-border traffic ceased in 1988 when Spanish railways decided to withdraw its connecting services. Although the turntable at Regua is still in use, most of the roads which lead off it contain dumped meter gauge steam locomotives, which last saw service during the late 1970s. Eleven examples remain, although two have been bought privately and restored for service in France and Austria.
Due to Portugal's temperate climate, most of the locomotives are reasonably intact, although they naturally show some superficial signs of decay. Like so many of the intermediate stations in Portugal, the one at Regua is often a lively place with a busy cafe and bar. All the 1400s that are used on the valley services, like this one bound for Chua, are based at Contumil in the suburbs of Oporto. The station here also contains several bay platforms on the left of this picture, which were built to serve the meter gauge branch to Chavesh. However, that service was cut back to Villa Real in 1990. The narrow gauge line to Villa Real follows the valley of the river Corgo and is worked by these interesting units that were bought from Yugoslavia. Originally built in the 1960s for the 760 mm Yugoslavian gauge, they were converted to meter gauge by CP in the 1980s. Back on the main broad gauge line and some 27 kilometers along the valley from Regua, Pinau is one of the most famous and distinctive stations in the region. The station here is renowned for its tiled murals, which attract visits from tourists not even traveling by train. The scenes generally depict wine growing. Pinau is, of course, one of the central points for viticulture in the Douro, and until the 1960s, the railway was used extensively to transport both grape pickers and wine. Even today, there is no major through road to directly link the small towns along the Douro Valley. However, in the late 1980s, a new road linking Oporto to Mirandela and the Spanish border was built to motorway standards. Inevitably, this has had a considerable effect on all passenger receipts, as it's now far quicker to travel out of the valley and join the new road. This is one of the most impoverished and isolated parts of Portugal, where the way of life for many agricultural workers has literally not changed for many centuries. The soil is very poor, and with so little rain but a temperate climate, the main crop is inevitably grapes, mainly for port and some local wine. Just before Tua Station, the river Tua enters the Douro. It's still just as attractive as during steam days, when this was one of the favorite locations on the line. Porcino to Oporto passenger services connected to a station with a meter gauge line that strikes northwards as far as Mirandella. Although nowhere near as popular as in the late 1970s, nevertheless at certain times of day this isolated station can still be surprisingly busy with transferring passengers. The service to Mirandela is the last of the narrow gauge lines to retain loco hauled trains, although rail cars were being introduced towards the end of 1996. This is one of the 10 9021 class locos built in 1976. The line climbed steeply out of Tua Station, running parallel with the broad gauge line to Regua before branching off to the north. With comparatively lightweight coaches in tow, the 9021s, which are fitted with 1,000 horsepower Alston diesel engines, are well equipped for the steady climb. Engineering on this route is very spectacular, with the railway clinging to the valley side. 
Of necessity, speed is low and the 54km journey to Mirandela will take around two hours. The scenery in the Tua Gorge is arguably the most spectacular to be found anywhere on the CP network. The decline in narrow gauge traffic means that currently there are only 21 of these Schindler Swiss built coaches left in service, most of the other routes being worked by rail cars of various types. All four of the original meter gauge lines which ran north from the Douro took their names from the river valleys which they followed. Today, all services terminate here at the attractive town of Mirandela. During the last few years, part of the route north to Braganza has recently been revived as a light rapid transit system for the town, and both lines now share a new maintenance shed about five kilometers out of town. Traffic on the main Regua to Pocino broad gauge line has also had to adapt to some major changes and the original Feradosa station is now stranded on the opposite riverbank to the line. It's nearly 20 years since the new deviation was built but the original bridge abutments across the river at Feradosa are still evident. The new route became necessary because, during the 1970s and 80s, one of the numerous new dams was built close by, considerably raising the level of this part of the river. Here, the first Oporto to Pocino service of the day negotiates the new alignments at Feridosa. Once it was possible to travel on to Spain or even continue northeast for another 105 kilometers by narrow gauge from Pocino to Duas Ingrajas. Incredibly, some freight traffic in the form of cement survives to travel along the full length of the Douro to the terminal at Pocino. The ubiquitous 1400s also have charge of all freight services along this route. We do hope that you've enjoyed this look at the unique railroads of this fascinating country. Bye for now. which involves crossing the river Shado at the old port of Alcasa do Sal. These characteristic sounding locos were given a new lease of life during the 1970s when their original engines were replaced with more powerful Alco diesel engines. Away from the urban areas, the intermediate stations on the line from Barreiro to Faro are connected by what Portuguese railways term regional trains, 
One typical regional service is this all-station stopping train from Barrero to Tunes, which is routed via Beja. The level of service provided for this extremely rural area with its sparse population is very poor, with only a few stopping trains a day. Most services are in the hands of these French-built 1200-class diesels, which are these days confined solely to working passenger services on the southern region and to shunting duties around Barrero. Elderly Swedish-built Noham rail cars are also used on some local services from Tunesh to Funchera. First commissioned in 1948, they still perform excellently, offering rapid acceleration and a surprising turn of speed. Hello and welcome to Railroad Journeys Around the World. Portugal is certainly one of the most inexpensive countries in the EC to travel around in. Yet it boasts a railway network of considerable diversity and appeal, featuring both broad and narrow gauge systems, much of it single tracked. And as we shall see, Portuguese railways, the CP stands for Caminos de Ferro Portugueses, operate an extremely varied and interesting fleet. With a total population of only 10 million people, this lightly inhabited country with its extensive railway network has benefited from a considerable rise in rail investment, particularly since joining the EC. Although today there's no longer any steam to be found, this is more than compensated by some of the unique diesel types, including the Class 1800, the English Electric 50s. There's also the equally interesting USA-built 1500 class Alco Locos and some colourful electric classes working the Lisbon to Oporto services. After pausing at the isolated junction station at Funchera to pick up passengers from the first northbound semi-fast to Barrero, this unit is setting off on the lengthy journey northeast to Beja and Evora. One of the main freight traffic flows on the southern region centres on a mineral branch to the Pyrites mine at Neves Corvo, which is situated off the secondary line from Funchera to Beja. Recently, a new station avoiding curve has been completed, which will allow trains to bypass Funchera. But for the time being at least, after running into Funchera from Arero, just north of Grandola, with its load of sand and one wagon of cement, the loco will have to run round to gain access to the secondary main line to Beja. The sand is bound for Piotas a short distance from the mine disposal point on the Neves Corvo branch, where it's used to infill at the Pyrites mine. Five kilometres from Funchera, the train gets to grips with this stiff climb past Panoish, towards the junction for the freight-only branch at Urik. Motive power for both the incoming sand trains and the outgoing Pyrites train are generally drawn from the 1900 class, which were built for dedicated freight use. Members of this class are fitted with dynamic braking, have a lower top speed of 100 km per hour compared to the later batch of 1931s which we saw earlier at work on the Algarve passenger services. French parentage, with the styling by Paul Arzen, typical of so many locomotives in France, is clearly evident. Problems with the French diesels fitted to these locomotives has resulted in them being derated from their original 3,000 horsepower to 2,700 horsepower. 
Imported coal through the port of Sinesh on the Atlantic coast is another important traffic flow on the southern region. The branch itself lost its passenger service in 1990, but sees a very heavy daily usage by freight. This pair of 1321 class locomotives are leaving the junction with the main line at Emadash Sado at the start of the 48 km run to Sinesh. The 18 locos in this class were bought second hand from Spanish railways in 1989. Pago Power Station is the main destination for imported coal, but there's also a book daily working for a pair of 1321s to take a consignment as far as Setil, where electric motive power will take over for the journey to Susalas or Masera. The control centre for operations on the... During the course of this programme, we'll also be examining some of the principal freight flows, including spectacular triple heading on Sinesh coal trains. Finally, there's a look at the extensive and highly scenic Douro Valley network. The location of the capital city of Lisbon on the northern shore of the huge estuary of the River Tagus and the lack of any rail crossing has always had an enormous effect on all potential journeys south and for the time being at least, all services to the Algarve must start or end at Barreiro. Main intercity services between Barreiro and Faro, the capital of the Algarve, are in the hands of these very obviously French-styled 1931-class diesel-electric locomotives. All told, there are a total of 17 locos in this distinctive class, which were built under license from Alstom in 1981, basically as a follow-on order to the first 13 examples of the original 1900 class. The line immediately south from Barrero to Setubal serves a number of dormitory towns and is used mainly by commuters who work in Lisbon. This local stopping service also employs some distinctive motive power, like these old 1500 class USA Alco diesels, originally introduced in 1948. A few local services are also booked to run further south to Funchera, 